We have a lot to talk about tonight. A lot of news from the weekend, and there was a lot of news today. But we begin tonight with the worst still ahead of us. You'd expect that the effect of the Thanksgiving surge would be probably another week and a week and a half from now. The problem is that's going to come right up to the beginning of the Christmas Hanukkah potential surge. So you have a surge upon a surge. So if those two things happen and we don't mitigate well, we don't listen to the public health measures that we need to follow, that we could start to see things really get bad in the middle of January. Without substantial mitigation, the middle of January can be a really dark time for us. Right now, we are seeing hundreds of thousands of new cases every single day, thousands of deaths every day. And Dr. Fauci says January could be a really dark time for us, which makes you wonder, what does a really dark time actually look like? Well, here it is. A new study from the University of Washington projects that despite vaccination scale up, we expect 539,000 cumulative deaths by April the 1st with peak daily deaths reaching 3,000 in mid to late January. That is a lot to take in, and it's really hard news that more than half of a million Americans will die, may die. And this president is using the last days of his administration, holding super spreader rallies and claiming he won the election that he didn't win. And another member of his inner circle, Rudy Giuliani, just tested positive after running around the country, pushing baseless conspiracy theories about the election. We, of course, wish him a speedy recovery. And we hope no one he might have exposed in Arizona in that legislature gets sick. This administration has done every single thing wrong since the beginning of the pandemic. And there's absolutely no reason to think that they will change in the next 44 days before Trump leaves office. Help is thankfully on the way in the form of a vaccine and the public health team Joe Biden just rolled out. But in the meantime, we're pretty much on our own. Starting us off tonight, Dr. Mario Ramirez. He's an emergency physician and the former coordinator of pandemics and emerging threats at the Department of Health and Human Services and Molly John Fast. She's editor, editor at large of For the Daily Beast and a participant in the Pfizer vaccine trials. Dr. Ramirez, I'll start with you. Just We just went through a lot of bad news. I mean, it's so hard to take in every day you wake up. You know, the number of deaths is growing. The number of hospitalizations is growing. But there is some good news on the horizon. The FDA could authorize a vaccine as soon as this week. If they do that, when will the first doses be administered to the American people? So it should be pretty soon after that, Zerlina. Um, Pfizer has already started to pre-position uh, hundreds of thousands of doses around the country. And if the EUA is approved, uh, the expectation and the hope is that vaccines should start being given within 48 to 72 hours of that approval. That is good news. Um, and as we've been talking uh, all last week and the week before that, in terms of the order of distribution, obviously it was going to frontline workers and those who are most vulnerable. Uh, and it is going to be some time before we can just get it at CVS, of course. Uh, follow up, Dr. Ramirez, in the same uni University of Washington study I mentioned at the top, researchers found that if we wear masks, literally just that, if we all just wear masks over our faces, we can save 66,000 lives by April, potentially. Are masks simply the most important tool in our arsenal in between now and the time we can get that vaccine? So masks are one of the most important tools, but the other most important tools, Erlina, and I can't stress this enough, you know, is social distancing. You know, unfortunately, we have so much disease that is spread over so much of the country now that we have really breached that period where people can continue to believe that they can socialize with other people, expect a mask is going to protect them. Um, masks are helpful, but they don't completely prevent the spread of disease. And we've really entered a new, more dangerous phase of the pandemic where the most sort of reliable way that you can keep from getting infected is to try to minimize your contact with people outside of your household. So you're, you're saying something a little bit different than the advice a couple of months ago. 
you know, over the summer where there wasn't as much community spread, um, you could probably maybe meet up with friends and sit outside with your masks, socially distanced, but, you know, maybe think that that was a pretty, pretty safe uh, activity. Now, though, you're saying it's so widespread throughout the country, Dr. Ramirez, that you really should stay within the walls of your household in terms of contact with others? So there are certainly some folks that are going to have to go to work and will have to be around other people to maintain core functioning parts of this economy right now. But what's important, and the reason that I think you've heard a similar message from other public health folks over the last few weeks, is that the U.S. health system is at a fundamentally different place from where we were at just a few months ago and even a few weeks ago. Um, you know, when we look at the hospital indicators across multiple markets, there are thousands of hospitals that are reporting staff shortages, bed shortages. And the, you know, the common denominator in the spring was always that we were going to try to flatten the curve to make sure that we didn't breach health system capacity. But that capacity has now been breached. And the message that people need to understand is that if you get sick from COVID or even from anything else, that if you come to a hospital, our ability to help you at one of those hospitals is extremely limited. And that's why it's become more dangerous to be around other people right now. It's important context. Molly, tell us about your experience with the Pfizer vaccine trial. I think a lot of people have questions uh, about the, the vaccines that they've heard about in the news. What was it actually like and why did you decide to do it? So I decided to do it because I saw that a lot of people had questions and I was worried that we were going to have a lot of people not taking this vaccine. And I knew it was important that people who were out there and writing pieces and should should show and demonstrate that it was safe. And so I felt like I was a good person to do it. So I applied to a bunch of different trials and I finally got into the Yale uh, part, a sort of Yale um, uh, hospital for, you know, their vaccine trial for Pfizer. And um, it was a really interesting and uh, kind of amazing experience. And I became a little bit friendly with my study doctors who were really impressive people, um, infectious disease experts and just like incredible people. But what I learned what you know, I didn't have any side effects. And just anecdotally, uh, nobody, most people in the trial thought they had gotten the placebo. So it really is a very well tolerated vaccine. And so that's very exciting. That is exciting. And I mean, I think when when folks at home who may have been concerned hear that you didn't personally have any side effects and others that you know in the same trial uh, didn't experience side effects, that is one um, detail that folks would want to know in terms of the safety um, of, of the vaccines. Dr. Ramirez, the president is holding a vaccine summit, whatever that means, uh, tomorrow at the White House. I, I'm really not sure what this is going to be or um, what's what, what's going to do for the American people, but we'll see. Um, they didn't invite anybody from the Biden transition, to my point. Um, and now we're learning that both Moderna and Pfizer aren't going either. <laughs> um, given all of that, uh, what's the point of the vaccine summit if no of none of the important folks are going to be in attendance? That's a great question, Zerlina. And I, you know, I don't know the right answer. Um, you know, ideally, you would want to have a summit where you have all the right people involved. And those in include your vaccine uh, producers, as well as the folks that are going to be taking over the actual distribution of your vaccine. You know, but I think the question that you're asking, right, is, is what is, what are the politics and the concerns around this? Uh, you know, and I think Clearly, that point has been made many times about the Trump administration's politicization of the response to this pandemic. And so, you know, my hope, right, along the whole way has been that we can remove politics from this discussion. And, you know, there are concerns that this summit, you know, is trending down that road. And, you know, what we're trying to do is get the public to buy into the validity and the value of this vaccine. And having a summit that, you know, runs the risk of highlighting the politics around this is just detrimental to the whole effect. Yeah, in terms of that piece, Molly, uh, the politicization of the entire pandemic response has been one of the through lines from the beginning. Um, Because Donald Trump at this point, he just wants credit. Um, You know, he wants to be the person that we all credit with getting the vaccine. Um, Do you see it that way? And do do you think he deserves any credit? No, (laughs) I think that he's made life a lot harder for everyone. And it's and and it's funny because it's like, the only part of this that he really cared about was the vaccines. Like, 
we could have saved so many lives just with mask wearing mm -hmm. and testing and tracing. And if you look at a country like South Korea, who had their first case around the same time we had our first case, if he had just done these simple things, we wouldn't have hundreds of thousands of people dead and we wouldn't be on track for more. So it's sort of interesting to me that the only thing he's interested in is this vaccine. And you can't sort of preach this anti-science rhetoric and then at the last minute be like, vaccines are great, right? Because a lot of his supporters have mm -hmm. already like heard him say all of these negative things about doctors and scientists. And even remember when he did a, um, a rally and they were saying, fire Fauci, right? Like this is the guy mm -hmm. who's now gonna tell you to take the vaccines. So I think it, this is gonna backfire and it's unfortunate because human lives are at stake. Absolutely. Dr. Ramirez, last uh, minute here. We mentioned that public that public health uh, team uh, that President-elect Biden rolled out. It includes California Attorney General Javier Becerra at HHS and Vivek Murthy uh, reprising his role as Surgeon General. How encouraged are you by the Biden, uh, by the team that, that President-elect Biden has put together so far? So I think these are all great picks. You know, my experience at HHS, uh, you know, were, was that the organization itself is a very large bureaucracy. Uh, you know, and I think one of the questions that a lot of folks have had uh, about uh, Javier Becerra is whether he, you know, is not a doctor uh, or doesn't have an adequate health background. But the truth is that to move an organization like HHS, you need to be able to move parts of a bureaucracy very efficiently. And I think he's clearly shown that he can do that. And I think there are all the reasons to believe that he can be successful in the role, particularly if he surrounds himself with other capable folks like the former Surgeon General who's going to reprise that role. Dr. Murthy is a very capable physician, uh, you know, has shown that he gives great advice uh, to the president-elect. And so, you know, I think this is a strong team that will go on to do really great things at HHS. Well, the American pe people's lives are uh, hanging in the balance and very hopeful um, that all of these experts can get in there and get to work so that um, as uh, the least amount of Americans are affected by this as possible. Dr. Mary Ramirez and Molly Jong-Fest, thank you so much for being here and stay safe.